Good afternoon. My name is Varun Bajram. I am a registered medical practitioner. I have an MBBS through the University of Ghana and a postgraduate master's in internal medicine through the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. Today, we're going to be talking briefly about what's known as a cerebrovascular accident, more commonly known as a stroke. My name is Bridger Ajram Saroop. I'm currently age 35. I know I look a little more young than that, right? But I'm age 35. I'm happily married to my wife, Darshini. And we have two wonderful kids, Christian and Crystalline, age six and age one. So before I go into, you know, more of it, let's first say, what is a stroke? Right? So basically a stroke is when you have an obstruction to the blood supply of a part of the brain. Now there are two main classes of stroke. There is the ischemic stroke, which happens when there's a blockage or a reduction in that blood flow to that part of the brain, which leads to something called ischemia infarction, which basically is like cell death. And the other type of a stroke is what we call a hemorrhagic stroke, where that blood vessel ruptures. And because of that rupture in the blood vessel, the blood flow doesn't get to go to the part of the brain and, well, eventually still leads to cell death. Before the stroke, I I was an audit professional where I served Gaisuku, my beloved Gaisuku, for 15 plus years. And then I went across to the Guyana Bull Board. I, um, I left the GGB for health concerns and, um, I started my own business operating a transportation service at the time when the stroke happened. That would have been on the 10th of May, 20, when, when to 23. I was 34 at the time. Um, when it happened, that was the day my daughter turned six months. I don't, I don't forget it. It's always stuck with me that six months after she was born, this happened. I always teach my son, since he was about one, never give up. I always keep trying. And when I was in the hospital, I heard his voice every, every time. Every time I tried to get up and move, I would hear, Dada, don't give up. Remember, don't give up. And it talked with me and it motivated me to keep going. And I tell people his little voice is what pulled me through. Because at the time, my baby was only three months. I'm um, six months, sorry. One of the greatest difficulty I've learned from my personal experience and discussing with many other stroke patients is the acceptance. I think accepting this is part of life has been one of my greatest weaknesses. My therapist worked with me from the start in Miss Amsterdam has to constantly remind me, you're normal. And I keep telling her, no, I'm not. Because this is not me. The inability to function or normally would function is not me. But she would constantly remind me that you are normal. And to accept this is me has been a struggle. I'm still struggling with it. I am. So one of the most common misconceptions is that, you know, um, this doesn't just affect elderly persons. I know growing up, most of the persons would have think that, you know, a stroke is something that would affect your grandparents or so forth. But these, you know, in these days, strokes can affect younger individuals as well, too. If you would tell any hundred people that know me that I had a stroke, they would not believe. Because I'm only 34. So the first thing, there is no age to this thing can happen to anybody. Um... In terms of a recent study that was done, um, in a first world country, approximately 10% of strokes happen in persons under the age of 45. However, when you start to go into third world countries, that uh, incident level actually goes up to 30%, or approximately 30% of the individuals who have been diagnosed with a stroke is actually under the age of 45. Um, in terms of that, majority of them are what we call a cryptogenic stroke, meaning that there is no underlining cause that we could identify. But then there's also the conventional and non-conventional risk factors. Conventional being things like diabetes, hypertension in younger persons, 
who can put them at risk. There's also coagulopathies or those who are at risk of blood clots. On that note, um, that especially goes to females in terms of females who are using oral birth control pills or so forth or any sort of um, birth control, they're at risk of, provo uh, of having provoked blood clots and that puts them at risk of a stroke. Certain underlying conditions as well too, like lupus or autoimmune conditions or even sickle cell disease puts a person at risk of having a blood clot. Um, things like malignancy, malignancies can put you at risk of getting a blood clot which could eventually lead to a stroke. So where it comes to stroke in young persons, some of the conventional risk factors can also play a part of that. Uh, approximately 10% of them were found to be diabetic. Another 70% were found to be troubling from hypertension, with another 50 to 60% having high cholesterol. 50% were found to be smokers, and 10% were found to be obese, with a BMI greater than 10, greater than 30. I operate a transportation service that caters specifically to school kids at the private settings. And uh, my routine would usually start at around 6.30 in the morning. On this particular day, um, it started off quite normal. But what happened, I am, I've been diabetic for a number of years. So on that, and I had some hypertensive issues. But it was never to the extent that I ever thought something like this could have happened. In terms of awareness, I can honestly say there is not enough information out there that speaks directly to a stroke. So I've done research on signs of a heart attack, um, different, different things that people would suffer with, with time, different illnesses, but never ever in my wildest dream, a stroke. I have never had any information prior to having a stroke on stroke. One, because the age factor for me was never a concern. Um, on the morning, I was driving normal, normal roads. And I kept noticing as though I started feeling weak while driving and shifting gears with my left hand. I noticed it felt a little weak. And um, at that time, I noticed like my chest was hurting me a little bit. But um, I never took it for anything serious. I thought probably my show was a little low. So I went and got a Gatorade to see if it would help the issue. Because most of the time I don't eat before I start work. When I get home about 9, I would eat. After like half of an hour, nothing changed. As I kept exiting the bus and re-entering the bus, I kept noticing that you know that my head swinging me a lot. I started feeling the inability to balance. After dropping off the kids at school, I left to come home. And along the Heroes Highway, just around that forest, I called my wife. I said, you know, like, it seems as though I'm getting a heart attack or something. That something is wrong. That I'm going to send in my life. Keep checking it, and if you see I stop one place too long, know that I'm in trouble. Get my father, follow the life, find me, and know that something is wrong with me. By the grace of God, I managed to drive and get home. Me, this check my pressure. It was a little high, but not significantly higher than what I would have seen before. So... I relaxed a little bit. I asked her to call my father because I'm a only child. And um, by the time my father got to me, we went to the industrial center. They checked the pressure. It was around 180, 100, 105 around the area. They gave me some meds half an hour after. It was still around 150, 100. So the doctor said to me, man, that he is suspecting it might be a stroke. Based on the little recollection I have of what is a stroke, I ain't seen my face twist. I ain't walking and dragging. In terms of identifying what is a stroke, we go by what's known as the fast mnemonic. 
All right. So F basically stands for things like facial drooping. A for weakness in the arms and legs. S for speech disorders. And then T means it's time to call the emergency department. So when you see someone experiencing any of those symptoms, you now will try to call the emergency department or take that individual to the nearest emergency department. We left and went over to public. The experience at public, on a scale of 1 to 10, the data negative 15. It was terrible. You got to, you, you reached there at the emergency with a referral. And I was forced to sit there and wait. Ideally, the first line of action would be to check the vitals, do the normal ABCs. Um, if you notice now that, yes, you confirm the person does have risk of having a stroke, then you try to get a CT or an MRI. Once that CT or MRI is done and it shows that the person doesn't have signs of a hemorrhagic stroke, and then you'll want to try to start them and things like getting the blood pressure under control, um, getting their cholesterol under control, getting their, um, their blood sugars under control, and also want to start to institute things like antiplatelet treatment to help with preventing clot formation. Ideally, in a first world country, if that person is reached to the hospital within four hours, we'd want to give them something called TPA, which basically is a um, tissue plasminogen activator to help to dissolve that clot. All right. And that would actually, you know, improve their prognosis in a more faster way. I had to go and do a brain scan, a CT scan. The results came back. I was impressed with the technology there, but not the quality of service. And he eventually told me that there is a probability that I might have a bleeding. But they needed to um, clarify it with the export. So once we have identified that the person has a stroke, then now it's down to long-term management in terms of controlling their underlying conditions, whether it be their diabetes, their hypertension, their cholesterol, or so forth. Eventually, they told me that they were going to keep me in for observation. And um, I was um, told I have to stay. That would have been the first time in my entire life I would have been in the hospital overnight for anything. When I got to the ward, I felt I could feel my body overheating. It was hot like fire. My skin was in burning pain. I got settled in. I was relaxing, trying to relax on the phone, communicating with my family because it was really hard. And the thought of me having a bleeding in my head, the only thought was that I might not go home back. That in itself was horrific. Having two small kids and my wife, it was hard. And um, throughout the night, I kept feeling worse in that I was on fire. I was at the door with a fan and it rained that night and I was literally by the door and still on fire. From nine o'clock, no nurse was around for me because I was trying to tell me something is wrong, something is wrong. I can feel my heart racing. I take my precious eye. I um, took the machine, put it on myself, check my pressure. My pressure was 200 over 110. I went to a, um, a gentleman at the desk. I could hear the nurses laughing inside. You could hear the chattering and talking, but nobody was outside us. This was male medical. And um, I told him he gave me something and um, told me to relax, an injection. I went, I couldn't sleep. Sleep was on my friend for the next five days, I average. That was on the Wednesday night. By Thursday, the doctors came. I still had functions in my hand, my leg and everything. 
that was stories in itself. And they told me that um, I needed to do an MRA. So in the meantime, my father was organizing the MRA at Morrissey. Um, they were checking me. They squeeze when I when they asked me to squeeze their hand, I could feel the loss of power. It wasn't gone; it was still there. I could still move my hand, hold my phone. It was functioning, but by two, three o'clock on Thursday afternoon, does the eleven enter me? I got up to go and urinate and after three steps I fell. Then is when it dawned on me I couldn't feel anything on my foot. And by the time the afternoon my hand was completely inoperable. I couldn't I could feel you touching me but there was no ability to move it, lift it up, move my foot, nothing. And that in itself I became confused. I started feeling depressed or worried because I was saying, you know, I prepared and I, I made videos. I went through my phone about two weeks ago and I found videos of me tell, talking to my kids them for my son's sixth body and my daughter's fourth body. Me telling them how much I love them and I wish I would have been there to see them because I didn't expect to come back. At that point in time, I didn't know what was happening because I didn't do the MRI as yet. They suspected a bleeding and not a clot. And I became even more worried because if it was continuously bleeding, then something was definitely going to happen worse because I already lost my whole left side already. And I was preparing for the worst. And that was really, really hard for me. Depending on the part of the brain that's damaged, they can have different uh, levels of deficits. For example, if somebody has a stroke in either the Broca's area or the Wernicke's area, they can have some amount of speech deficit. In that case, it becomes difficult for you to understand what the person is saying. So in terms of a family, you know, now that might lead to problems with communication. You might not be able to understand what your relative is saying, what they need if they're experiencing some sort of discomfort, if they're having problems or so forth because they can't articulate that. They can also have issues with swallowing or dysphagia where they, when they try to eat the food isn't going down and you know, they might need to rely on a feeding tube for that. And you know, it takes a lot from some family to now have to feed their relative through a tube. They don't know, you know, how easy or how difficult it is going to be. And then also they have to deal with things of the tube getting dislodged and leading to other complications, like for example, aspiration pneumonia. And then also there's also the deficit in terms of the weakness, of the limbs, so whether it be on your upper left or lower left limb or your upper right or lower left right limb, where now you'll have difficulties with ambulation. For example, if somebody has a weakness to their entire left side and they can't walk properly or the entire right side, they can't use their hand, they can't sign anything, they can't write or so forth. Right, so there's also that sort of um, difficulties that family members will now have to deal with. A lot of these persons, you know, they can't move around easily, so they require wheelchairs or they require, you know, someone to help them do simple things like feeding them, changing their clothes, tidying them, or so forth. A work made from GGB put me on to a therapist, and I started therapy the Monday after I came out of the hospital. And what I've learned so far on the physical recovery itself is that there are periods of neuroplasticity that occurs in the brain where the brain tries its best to remap your functions from the parts that have been damaged in your brain because of the stroke. And um, during that time, you have the most function the most activities in your brain so you can get back to some level of independence where your brain works its best for you and then now if they have some sort of a deficit that's left back then we do things in terms of 
physical therapy, if they have speech disorders, they'll need speech therapy and so forth. The best chance you might have to recover is when you take therapy as early as possible and work on yourself. Don't give up on yourself, that you keep working to get back your functions with your therapist. Whether it's the palms or it's private if you can afford it, therapy is the best option for you to get back there. The mental health, oh my God. This is honestly, generally in this country is the most underrated issue in our country on a, for both male and female, but for men especially, is the most underrated and less talked about issue in our country. And when you're in a position like this, where your life move, moves from being independent to becoming dependent and highly dependable, highly dependent on others to help you, it takes a toll on you beyond comparison. I don't believe this 5, 10, 15, 20, half an hour interview can give justice to what I'm trying to explain in terms of mental health. It takes a drain on you completely. If it, and I believe I honestly had a good support system. I have, I have my wife who has taken care of me. It ain't no easy for me and she. It has been hard, but she has not given up on me. Many men didn't have that. There's one. I have my parents who supported me. I have family. I've had some good friends. I've had some good people in my life that supported me. And I honestly don't believe many have that. And even though I've had that, it has been hard mentally. It does have a sort of a impact on your mental health. But I actually had uh, two patients who committed suicide after they developed a stroke because of, um, you know, the, the, the way how they felt there, they were a burden on their family and so forth. Right? So it does impact your, your mental health as well too. I've never thought about suicide before May 10th of 2023. I've never had that thought before. After that, it has been a friendly thought constantly bombarding my mind and my kids and God Almighty that kept me from not doing because it's difficult, you know, to, in every aspect, financially, that way, especially when you have people depending on you, you got to worry who will take care of them. Financially, it, it's, it sucks to dry. Whatever savings you have will go. In terms of support financially from the government, the organizations around, very minimal to nothing much. I am not politically affiliated, but I can say $19,000 a month can't cut it. For many people, I ask them, what do you think is public assistance? from the government for people with disability. A gentleman who was my neighbor, we are friends and we talk. And when I ask him this question, like I ask many people, how much you think it is? Then man calls something, give them figures that, that was real, meaning a headache. Most of them say 50,000. The reality is it's not even 50% of 50,000, it's 19,000 now. Before it was less than that. And that is nothing to assist somebody with a stroke or any sort of disability. It's nothing much to help them. Food, your diet changes. The things you could eat, you can't eat before. You can't eat it now. You got to look at the quality of food you eat, medication. If you don't have transportation, taxi alone 
At the time I was living in Greater Georgetown, Commons Lodge, a taxi to go to the palms for therapy and return home alone is $1,500. You gotta go two times a week. There's $3,000 per week. Multiply by four. That is twelve grand. That money finishes it like nothing. So I hope this part don't get this out. Where the government can do something more. Let me touch on another aspect that I find important for me. Accessibility to work. I am a qualified man. I've been an auditor all my work and life professionally. I would love to go back to the to the working environment. But first thing to look at you. You can't walk properly. How you gonna walk? By God's grace, my neurological functions are still good. I don't have memory issues. My intellect was not affected. But you're going to interview. And the first thing to do is write you off. I went one place for an interview since I've gotten sick. Not because I would really want to work as a dumb plan for pay cheap. But I'm happy that... The gentleman at Royal um, Chicken didn't write me off. He had an interview with me, treated me as normal as anybody else. And was good for many places to look at you and they write you off. The stigma attached to people with disability and people with stroke is hard. I never understood it until I fell into that bracket. Yeah, I know it is a struggle for me. One of the things I found that is really difficult for people with disabilities generally and even a stroke is accessibility to basic things. Like, for example, I have an application for housing. I got through, but the price is wrong for a man like me. In this position, financially, things have changed. And I believe that accessibility to these things should also change. Accessibility to funds, accessibility to housing. That is a big man for me. I have two kids. I have my wife. We want our own house, but to have accessibility to it is difficult financially because, for example, you go to the bank. The bank don't care if you make any money. You got to produce evidence of pay slip, payroll, three years of pay slip, three years of this, three years of that. Where would I get that? You know, things like these, there need to be provisions in these aspects for people like us. I would love to find a job that caters for my situation where it's not strenuous, but I can use my intellect and work for me. I can sit on a computer, I can work. All the experience I've garnered in my professional line of work, I can still access it in terms of the academics. To get up and physically go and walk around and do things is difficult for me. But I want to be able to work, take care of my family, ensure my kids are educated. I want to be able to earn so I can take care of them decently. At some point in time, pay out housing for Milan. Then eventually build and live a decent standard of life, provide for my family. And be the father I've always wanted to be. You know, when something like this happens, life should not have to change. In a way that it's so negatively downwards that you don't see yourself coming out of it. There's a young lady, similar in age to me, who had a stroke. And her partner walked away from her. And I can imagine what that did to her. I am happy that I still have my wife supporting me. And these are little things that affect the recovery process. And it affects the question, how can life go on after a stroke? For some, there is no hope. I have two kids, I have to create that hope. I have to keep it going. I gotta find a way to make it work. But there needs to be accessibility to for a job. Means of income. I ain't want no handout. I want the I want the opportunity to work. I want the opportunity 
to go out there or to take care of my family. Me want freebies. But I believe the some patients have not recovered as far as I have. I can walk again. I can drive. I don't have the full functionality of my left hand as yet. As yet, because I am positive that it will get better. Many people have not recovered to the extent that they can walk. And that means they have even more restrictions to work. There is life after a stroke. Uh, you know, I would like to tell all those who are suffering with a stroke that your life doesn't end there. With treatment, controlling your underlying conditions, physical therapy, speech therapy, you can regain back some function. And, you know, with the aim of improving your quality of life. Right. So your life doesn't end after having a stroke. 